So the first rule of design is that any yield of an element not put to productive use by the ecosystem results in pollution. So on your farm, there are all kinds of elements. There's plants, there's animals, there's structures, you know, buildings, fences, those are all elements. And each one of those elements has something that it yields, something that it gives to your whole ecosystem on your farm. And uh, if you can't find a use for uh, something that is offered by an element, it will eventually build up until the point that it causes pollution. So this is the classic kind of needs and yields analogy that is really the, the center of, of permaculture design. And um, you know, one of the best ways to illustrate this is just to think about a chicken. What are all the things that a chicken needs? Yeah, water, food, grit, shelter, protection, uh, calcium, air, dust baths, other chickens, it needs carbon for its nests, roosts, stuff like that. And then for its yields, it yields things like eggs, manure, meat, feathers, methane, heat, noise, work in terms of scratching, uh, and other, uh, it yields other chickens, poultry dust, all that kind of stuff. So the two rules of design, we're going to be talking about the, the first side, which is the yields piece, is uh, if you have chickens as an element on, in your ecosystem, they yield those things, whether you like it or not. And if you can't find a use for all of those products or yields of that element, they will eventually build up and become a problem. So I'm sure everybody who has, who here has chickens? In the farm right now. Okay, awesome. You'll definitely uh, appreciate this. So if you have straw bales on your properties, you probably have experienced uh, chickens finding them and pulling them out straw by straw <laughs> until the bales collapse and turn into a pile of mush. Um, so that's a yield from that element. And because it's not being put to productive use, it becomes a pollution. It's, it's a pain in your butt. You have to deal with it now. And so for me, you know, this was uh, an insight that I, um, uh, I noticed one day while I was out in my garden. And I thought, hey, I wonder if I could put this to productive use. I wonder if I could use that energy from that element, that yield, and use it to save uh, some work for me in uh, another part of my, my garden. So this is a, just to show you an example of, of this. This is the straw bale. I just came and set it down in my corral, cut the two strings, and I don't know, the chickens must have uh, um, realized that the sound of, of cutting twine, because they all just turn their heads, and they just start running over, and within a few minutes, the whole straw bale is just scratched out, the seeds are gone, and, um, you know, and they're great for helping to spread straw around the pen, but if you have a whole stack of those that you're keeping you know, somewhere to um, store for the winter, it's a pain because they'll turn that whole stack of bales into uh, basically a compost pile. So uh, this was something that I used to do um, in, my, in my gardens here when I was planting garlic. Uh, because we have such cold winters, I have to use mulch on my, uh, to cover my garlic as I plant it in the fall. And it would take me, this is a, it's about 4,000 garlic in that uh, particular uh, system there. There's 1,000 heads per row. And so I would go and, and put the straw and cut the strings. And it would take about one hour for one person to do a whole row. So about four hours. And the whole time I was doing that, um, there's a little fence you can kind of see along the, the side here. Um, the whole time I'm cutting these, bailing, these strings and spreading the straw around, the chickens are literally flying over this fence, trying to come at the straw, and I'm like throwing them out and chasing them around, and, and uh, it was just a real pain in my butt <clears throat> until I realized, hey, I wonder if I could, I could harvest this somehow. I wonder if I could get them to spread the straw for me. So uh, one of the things, that's just a basic insight, and I've been, we've been developing this system over the past kind of nine years now on the farm, but... Um, this is our kind of integrated livestock system on the farm, and it's designed off of a hub and spoke model. So this uh, center of the system is like the hub of a wheel, and there's all these different spokes that radiate off the hub of that wheel, and each of those spokes represents a different forage resource or a different pen system that the livestock can be led into at different times of the year. And inside this integrated livestock system, we've got uh, chickens, pigs, milk cows, and beef cows at certain times of the year. But you could also have things like sheep, rabbits, goats. Um, you could have ducks would work really well. It would just change the different kinds of spokes and the kinds of fencing that you would have. So in this particular system, this is our chicken house right here. And most of the time, our chickens free range. We don't use any fencing whatsoever. We don't have a lot of predators in our area. But for certain times of the year, I actually want them to come into my garden here, which is this area 
right behind it. And there's just a little door on the back side of their chicken house. So I just I shut the front door, open the back door, and I use some of the electro netting from Premier One here to fence them out into my garden for a lot of different things. And one of them uh, is now to help spread the straw on my garlic. So I use a lot of mulch in my gardens because it's a great way to build soil. But if you've ever used mulch in your, your, uh, your gardens, you'll also realize that uh, it's really difficult to do any kind of rotor tilling or bed preparation with all that mulch the next year because you've got long fibers that find their way to wrap around your rotor tillers and your tools and implements. And then you spend, for every 50 minutes you spend rotor tilling, you spend an hour with vice grips pulling straw off your tiller blades. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> laughter of recognition. It's good, it's good. We're going to get all this, this emotion out of the frustration for years. So, uh, yeah, we do a lot of companion planting and mulching. And uh, so one of the ways that we use chickens now is for uh, uh, breaking up those straws, because as they're scratching around, they're, they're slicing and dicing them. They're also doing, uh, eating out any weeds or pests. So everything that I grow in my garden stays in my garden. I don't take off my potato vines, anything else. I just I cut it up into, or lay it on the ground. If it's too tough, and we knock down themselves, and then let them in to do the work. So this is a this is that particular row here, which is there's uh, potatoes on the side here, onions with a cover crop of crimson clover, and then some uh, parsnips there. And so once the potatoes have been and the onions have have died in the fall and and uh, they've been harvested, I pull those out and then I just run a little bit of electro netting just from the, behind the chicken house back into my garden. I open a door and the chickens are now out in my garden. And I'll use feeders and waters to help encourage them to come out. And you know, if I want them to concentrate their energy in a certain particular area of the garden, uh, I can just put a feeder somewhere else if I want more manure there or more scratching. And they'll come through and, and prepare that soil bed for me. So after they've come through, I, I will rotate till it once. And there's no more stuff wrapped around my blades as I'm getting my, uh, my bed preparation. That's a little garlic planter there that's just made it of two old wagon wheels and some hair bars that are welded on seven inch spacings. So we come in there um, with a single pass of the rotor tiller. That's what our, uh, our bed prep looks like. And then I set my straw bales down like I normally would, but this time, as opposed to fighting the chickens to keep them out of the straw, I just let them come in, cut the strings as they were, and that's what it looked like, what is that, six days later, seven days later. I had a bit of snow in the fall there, but it, as it started to melt off. So they did a fantastic job of spreading that straw out, pulling any weed seeds that the combine had missed or the grain seeds, adding a lot of nitrogen into the, the um, mix there. And, uh, you know, next spring, the garlic pops up. I weed it once in July 15th. So I come through and, and uh, pull any of the stuff that's, that's competing. And then August 15th, that's usually when I harvest. You know, she'll be gasping right now. <laughs> this is um, some hard neck garlic. And then the nice thing is, is once I've harvested the garlic, I just put them back out again. And uh, you can see, you know, all the, the regrowth from any of the, the cover crop that I had planted and the, all the straw that's left over there. Um, I can put those out there, but I can also add in my, uh, another element from that same integrated livestock system. If, uh, you know, say this stuff is too tall for the chickens to handle, I can get my other little helpers in there, the pigs, and with a single uh, strand of electric wire, I can rotate them through this garden and it'll look like that after six days with less than 30 hundred pound pigs and you know, four sows. This whole uh, garden area is about a third of an acre on our property here. And as soon as they're done that, um, so I went from that to that and yeah, seven days and you can see all that you know we're talking six in, six to eight inches of, of, of you know barley straw that ends up like that after the chickens come through question How are you getting the pigs in there? Are they part of that spoke? yeah they're part of that they're part of that spoke and there's just a, there's a different size door for them so the chickens have a little door and the pigs have a, a taller door that they can they can just slip through this is another system that uh, this is a, a cover crop that I put in it was rye that I used to grow around my, uh, my uh, squash. And uh, so this is a different, different year altogether, but same electro netting. And once the squash is harvested, they can come in and they just bomb all that, uh, that rye to the ground, pick out any of the seed heads that are there, uh, add a lot of manure. You can see them concentrated in little bubbles. 
So as I'm feeding them, I just feed them in a different spot every day and it helps spread out the, the manure. So in this particular garden, uh, I've never once added compost and it went from you know, a beat up old hay field to uh, a garden that just is absolutely abundant. This is a single hill of potatoes here, uh, Amarosa potatoes, there's over 45 potatoes in one hill and uh, no fertilizer, no compost for 30 years, just with, with livestock. So uh, one of the quotes from one of the other founders of permaculture is that traditional agriculture was labor intensive, industrial agriculture is energy intensive, and permaculture design systems were information and design intensive. There's another saying, which is that for every one hour of work, you should do 100 hours of thinking. And uh, I think it's, I'm not very smart, so for me it's about a thousand hours uh, for every one hour that I do. 